All right, so the Indian Removal Act of 1830 allowed the federal government to trade lands west of the Mississippi River for lands east of the Mississippi River. So what they want to do here is relocate um, Native American tribes um, from places like Georgia and Florida and move them to, you know, like Oklahoma, for example. Um, now, Jackson supported this act. Um, and the tribes, the uh, Native American tribes that are involved in this are the Cherokees, the Creek, uh, the Choctaws, Chickasaws, and Seminole Indians. Um, and again, like the area that we're talking about here is Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi. Okay, so they want to relocate them, move them somewhere else. And this kind of goes part and parcel with like American attitudes about Native Americans was that, you know, they were getting in the way of progress. And so, you know, this wasn't about incorporating them into American life. That was never the point of any of this. It was simply to move them out of the way. Um, and so, you know, Jackson supported it. And uh, these uh, Native American tribes are gonna, pull uh, something interesting here. They're going to sue the federal government um, in court and they win. Okay. So the Supreme Court agrees uh, with the Native Americans um, because essentially the argument is that uh, these tribes are sovereign nations. And as a sovereign nation, Congress has no right or authority to tell them what to do or relocate them or move them or can go into any kind of negotiations or treaties with them. Um, you would need to need a formal treaty um, to do that. And so therefore the Indian Removal Act of 1839 was you know, unenforceable. And so Jackson took issue with this and uh, basically said, you know, John Mar Marshall has made his decision. Now let him enforce it. Basically saying like, okay, well, what are you going to do, right? You and what army <laughs> are going to stop me? Um, and it has, like I said, detrimental, just hugely important and catastrophic consequences for these tribes. Um, essentially what happens is, well, first of all, two things. They're going to be moved out of the way. They're going to be relocated um, in part because a tiny fraction of the Cherokee Nation signed a treaty with, um, with Jackson. Um, those folks are going to be seen as traitors and uh, are, they get killed, um, you know, for what they did. Um, but in 1838 and 1839, which is after Andrew Jackson is out of office, um, a quarter of those, you know, 18,000 Native Americans died in the Trail of Tears, right? And it's really sad if you look into, you know, some of the stuff that happened there, that forced removal, um, you know, they would die along the way and they weren't given proper burial or anything like that. Just devastating, devastating stuff. And so, you know, Jackson's relationship with the Native Americans is a complicated one. Uh, in some ways, it reflects, you know, contemporary attitudes towards Native Americans. You know, this kind of like uh, misplaced paternalism um, where he kind of like wants to take care of them and believes that this is like in their best interest. Um, but then there's also this other side of him that believes that you know, Indian people as a whole were destined for extinction anyways. And to complicate things even more, I mean, Jackson ended up adopting a Native American kid. Um, but <laughs> while well, that seems like, oh, how nice, you know, he must really like them. Um, he only did that after, you know, that kid's parents were killed in battle fighting, you know, his men. So it's, uh, it's complicated stuff, but, uh, you know, what do you think uh, was Andrew Jackson's attitude towards Native Americans, you know, in light of all of this? He had them, you know, removed. And uh, there was even uh, 
one of the original generals that was supposed to do that actually quit over it, like it's in protest. Um, and Winfield Scott uh, comes in and, and replaces him. Winfield Scott, we're going to talk about him next in the next unit. Uh, he's the one that essentially, you know, invades Mexico during the Mexican-American War. And, uh, you know, he's this big, big hero. Uh, but anyways, um, so anyways, Jackson also changed uh, the banking system. This is what I was telling, like, what do you think? What was his reason, right, for removing the Native Americans populated? Uh, populations, excuse me, motivated by humanitarian reasons, or was it something else? What do you think? It's kind of an interesting uh, topic. I wish we were doing a discussion on this, um, but it's too late. Um, anyways, let's talk about the Panic of 1837 as we finish up with our lecture on Andrew Jackson. Uh, Jackson, like I said, is going to change the banking system, right? Once they closed the National Bank, once its charter ran out, um, you know, the American banking is going to be dominated by, um, you know, the second uh, national bank uh, with that veto, right? It, it essentially canceled the renewal of that charter. And so I told you about this, Nicholas Biddle goes involved. Um, Jackson, you know, set himself up as a defender of the common people, which is why he, um, this is why he justified the use of his veto power. Um, and, and really, if we put things into perspective, um, Jackson used veto more than anyone ever before. Um, I believe like more than all the presidents had, all of them together. Uh, that's how much he uses veto power, right? And so the result in all of this and the canceling of, of the charter um, is that there isn't going to be an institution that is going to be able to manage federal funds, right? And so the money went into these local banks, right? The pet banks, uh, you know, owned by people that were friendly to him, supporters of him. So he's essentially rewarding his political supporters, right? This is patronage, guys. This is what the spoil system is about. Um, and so I, I told you a little bit about this already. The banks are going to be printing money. Uh, they went from $10 million to $149 million. This leads to inflation. Okay. And so it's bad for wage workers and it's bad for everybody else, you know, period, because money is then worthless and no one's going to take it. And this leads directly into the panic of 1837. Um, the economic collapse, like I said, lasted until um, 1843. Okay, so that was until before, right before the Civil War. I mean, yeah, I don't know, but maybe I should delete that part. Anyways, it's the most disastrous economic policy in the history of the United States. Um, and then, of course, this was made even worse by the species circular, right, which we talked about already. So Executive Order 8 of 1836 required the government to prohibit the acceptance of paper money, could only collect gold or silver, right, which is specie, uh, resulted in a fall in demand for Western lands and a drained specie from New York banks, right? They did a run on the banks. Of course, they did. And uh, several hundred banks are going to close as a result of it. Okay, so let's talk about uh, Jackson's Democrats, right? So the rise of the second two-party system. Uh, remember, we are coming out of the era of good feelings. And so let's talk about, you know, this opposition party. First, let's talk about Jackson's Democrats. Remember, they believe they're the inheritors, right, of Jeffersonian dem democratic ideals. Um, so in a way, they are nationalistic. They believe in small federal government. They believe in the right to privacy. They support America's westward expansion and other Democrats included Martin Van Buren and James K. Polk. Uh, the Whigs by comparison, you know, these are business uh, Democrats, right? Business Democrats became the Whigs. Uh, they are the remaining Democrats that are aligned themselves with agrarian interests. So slavery, okay? Uh, these guys favored an active federal government. They supported using federal funds to finance internal improvements. 
Uh, they believed in using government power to promote the moral health of the nation. They viewed banks to be essential in controlling the flow of money and they are comfortable with market capitalism. So big changes there, right? So who are the supporters of these ways, right? They are farmers who wanted better transportation facilities for their produce. They are also workers who wanted to benefit from economic growth and planters that wanted a stable bank system, okay? Who are the supporters of the Democrats, right? Of Jackson's Democrats. They are farmers and workers who felt alienated by the commercialized economy. They are small businessmen who hope to protect, I'm sorry, to hope to be protected against monopolies. Irish immigrants who immigrated in large numbers during the 1840s as well. So the second stable two-party system was established by the election of 1840. More on that later. Um, it helped relieve sectional tensions over slavery for now, um, but it also caused the hostilities between the North and the South um, to continue, but yet be hidden for now. <laughs> okay. Uh, American life between 1830 and 1860, uh, it became increasingly regionalized due to slavery. Uh, the expansion of the United States and commercial development. So what is happening here during this time? You got North, South and West drifting apart politically, socially, economically, all kinds of ways, okay? Different ways of living uh, is going to develop regionalized identities, okay? All right, so I think this is where we're gonna end. Uh, in the next unit, we're gonna talk about, you know, West continued westward expansion manifest destiny, all of that. Uh, make sure that you know, you're able to identify the changes of the market revolution, um, how immigration and urbanization you know, affected life in the North. What's going on in the South? Well, with the invention of the cotton gin, cotton becomes king. And uh, as America continues to grow, cotton grows with them and so do people slaves. So the expansion of slavery, the growth of slavery into neighboring states or territories is going to continue to be an issue. Um, and so even though, you know, the age of Jackson started out uh, with expansion of democracy, by the time we get to the end of this chapter, um, we see that democracy being threatened by the growth of slavery. Um, the challenges, you know, that come out of these political divisions and a much more regionalized America that develops. And then, of course, um, the inability to compromise over, you know, what direction the nation should be going in. So uh, with that in mind, I hope that you uh, enjoyed this lecture, I hope that you learned something. Um, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to uh, send me an email or join me during my office hours. And uh, I'll see what I can do. Okay, so uh, with that, I'll let you guys go. I hope you enjoyed this one. I sure did. Um, and I'll see you on the next lecture. Bye.